wilderness, an uncultivated, uninhabited, and inhospitable region. Yet we also know wilderness times in our lives like this, when changes in ourselves or our circumstances cause us to head through unfamiliar and unknown landscape. Wilderness can also be a time we choose. Choose wilderness? Why would we choose to go through the wilderness? Well, it is what Jesus does in Matthew 4. Right after he's baptized, the Spirit descends and God speaks, naming Jesus as beloved. Then he follows the Spirit into the desert wilderness. He's alone and starving. He faces three temptations. Then on the other side, right after 40 days of wilderness, Jesus gets at it, beginning his work of justice and wholeness and inclusive love. Do you see how these 40 days through wilderness are 40 days that form Jesus connecting the dots between who he is as beloved and what he's to do in the world? The wilderness forms Jesus into who he is and what he is to do. You see, there's something about the wilderness, which is why in the season of Lent, the six weeks leading up to Easter, Jesus followers throughout the centuries choose to go through the wilderness, choosing wilderness for spiritual formation. A time of learning, praying, listening, fasting, giving things up to make room in our bodies and lives to be formed by the Spirit. Which is why these 40 days of Lent at Salt House, we follow Jesus through his 40 days in the wilderness, letting the three temptations he faced confront the deep narratives and questions buried in us. We choose the wilderness because the wilderness can form us into who we are and what we are to do. So, will you let it? Will you follow Jesus through the wilderness to let it ask of you the deep questions that form you? This Lent, on our way to death on the cross and resurrection on the other side, we get our wilderness on together. Are you ready to hear a good story? We're leaving our time now, and we're leaving our place now. And we are going to a time and place when the God Most High walked the earth as one of us. There are four directions, north, east, south, and west. And the fifth direction is within. That is where our story takes place, on the holy and wild ground of your inner desert. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a Jewish leader. He came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, <clears throat> Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God because no one could do these signs you do apart from the presence of God. And Jesus answered him, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. And Nicodemus said, uh, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb to be born? And Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and of the Spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind, the wind blows wherever it chooses. You hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus said, How can these things be? And Jesus answered him, Are you Israel's teacher? and you do not understand these things. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, 
and we testify to what we have seen, and you do not under receive our testimony. No one has come from above except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Look, look, God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Seriously, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So Jesus and Nicodemus, Jesus encountering a man in his own moment of wilderness, yes? Nicodemus is a religious leader who is confounded by what Jesus is doing. He doesn't, it doesn't make sense to him. It doesn't make sense according to the law. He comes at night under the cover of darkness. Is Nicodemus afraid to be seen? Probably. And he's probably ashamed because he should, he should be in the know, and he's not. He doesn't get it. And it shakes his identity. Because Nicodemus, if he doesn't know and understand what's going on religiously, what God is doing, then who is he? We get to watch the transformation happen in him. So this, this morning is our introduction into the wilderness today. We are in this series, heading through the wilderness with Jesus as told in Matthew 4. Man, who, know, who knew that when we picked this theme through the wilderness, like as our Lenten journey, that with like the cloud of COVID-19 would descend, like immediately forcing us all into isolation and really wilderness in a very real way, right? Man, Jesus, uh, Jason said it this uh, yesterday. He said, man, this week has been a year. And I was like, yes, yes, it has. <laughs> Oh, but I'm grateful that we get to be together in this way, in this crazy time that we're in, as we intentionally are not gathering together for the sake of slowing the spread of COVID-19, for the sake of the vulnerable folks in our community here at Sawhouse, but also beyond, too. So this is how we love our neighbors well right now, is by, being, by taking these precautions, even if we are healthy. And this is also then us experimenting with how to be God's people in a creative way in the midst of this. So today, we enter uh, the first of the three temptations that Jesus experiences in the wilderness, letting it ask of us the same deep questions about who we are. So hopefully you took time this week to read and reread the text from Matthew 4. It's one of the things that we are doing this Lent. Uh, we read the text uh, from the Sunday that we experience. We read it in the following week. So this week we'll be reading this text of Jesus and Nicodemus, what we've just experienced. Thank you so much to Mark. That was incredible. All memorized and so heartfelt. That just was incredible. So plan on reading John 3 this week, okay? So let's dive into the wilderness. Uh, so this is the part of the wilderness that we experience today. The first temptation of Jesus in the wilderness it goes like this. After, fa after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus was hungry, right? The tempter came to Jesus and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, one shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. <sighs> wow. So this is temptation number one. In Jesus' hunger to turn stones to bread. So to dig into this today, we're going to weave in a few perspectives from our Native American siblings because it adds beautiful layers to how we experience Jesus in the wilderness, okay? So I say that just fully owning that I don't know a lot about Native tradition, 
but I haven't, but I, but I have been gobbling up a lot of what Stephen Charleston has to say. He's a Native American Episcopal priest. So he beautifully integrates Christianity with Native American tradition, tradition, and it's just, it's so good, and it really enhances how we experience wilderness. So we'll weave two Native American perspectives into this, okay? Okay. So the first is just a word about the devil, the tempter in this text. Our Native American siblings, they don't personify evil uh, in the devil, like in, in the tempter. They don't personify evil. They don't identify evil as a being outside of themselves. There can be evil spirits or people acting with evil, but not like a singular like mastermind of evil. So this whole scene of Jesus in the wilderness, they see the devil, the tempter, as projection of the self. And this is one way for us to read it too, like an internal dialogue, a struggle that's playing out because the nature of evil is within all of us just as the nature of God is within us. And we've all experienced this kind of struggle against the voices that speak to us from within, yes? So that's one way to hold this, kind of letting that lens be in there too. So with that in mind, also a reminder about how we read Jesus in the Bible. Jesus represents God's people. So we, we read Jesus in this text as us, right? Here is our own wilderness and our own struggle too. So the first thing that we notice is the first word that the tempter, that this voice says, if, if, if you are the son of God, or for us, if you really are a child of God, if you really are the beloved of God, remember from last week, this is what we talked about, how we begin in the wilderness, beloved is where we begin. Just like Jesus emerging out of the baptism waters right before the wilderness, we hear that word for us too. But this little word, if, it undermines identity. If this is who you are, then you should be able to do that. Stones to bread, prove who you are, show me what you can do. So we hear underneath like that undermining, self-doubt inflicting implication that if you can't do this, then who are you? If you can't do this, who are you? So we, we know this internal doubt, don't we, right? This kind of voice. All wrapped up in this is one of the great lies that exists about our identity. It's the lie that I am what I do. I am what I do. This temptation that Jesus encounters to perform well, to get her done, we know we are deeply identified with what we do as defining who we are. It's, it's the most common way we introduce and describe ourselves. I was thinking about what this looks like for me. I was realizing that for me, it's when I introduce myself, it's like, hey, I'm Sarah. Yeah, I'm a pastor, but it's like a really cool church and we're really inclusive. It's like I add all these like things like with my, to deal with my presumptions of what people, what I think people think of a, past, a pastor does or thinks or believes so that it shows something about who I am and what I do, right? So I try to like mitigate that. But I wonder about you, how do you introduce yourself? What are the things that you do that you kind of tag with who you are? What labels do you use? If you want, we'd love to see some of those responses in the comments there on the video. Uh, uh, whether you're listening live now or even if you're listening later, what labels do you use for yourself? But that's not who we are, right? The thing about this lie we all know, right? We all know this is reinforced all around us. You are what you do, you are what you do. What you do will define who you are. We know this, and we know that this is a lie, right? But we hardly know anything else. We are so enmeshed in the system that we can't just like talk about it right now. Like we can't just like intellectually identify it and just like walk away from it, walk away from this construct of letting what we do define who we are and be like, okay, I guess I'm done with that. I'm not gonna do that anymore, right? Like it's just, it's here. So Jesus is confronted with this lie, and we are too. And we call out this lie for what it is, because we are not what we do, but that's just the first thing that we wanna name in this temptation, okay? And then we're gonna come back to this later, all right? Then the second thing in this temptation contains our second perspective from Native American tradition. It is, uh, it is to notice the significance that Jesus is asked to change a stone to bread. I always, I realize I always get hung up on the bread part of this equation, but the stone has real significance. 
So in traditional native spiritual understanding, all of creation is endowed with the spirit of God. Like everything that is created is by God possesses the mind of God. Everything, which is a pretty huge thing to think about. So this is why in native tradition, there's such reverence granted to all of our natural world and all of its creatures because of the wisdom that it all holds. And what was created first? What's been around the longest on this earth? Rocks, stones. Many native traditions speak of the stones of the earth as our oldest relatives in a spiritual sense. And I just love that. Stones are known, they have known the mind of God for a really long time. Therefore, native people pay attention to stones, mountains, and canyons because these first elements embody the ancient will of God in creation. Isn't that something? So from a native lens, we're not surprised that Jesus would pay attention to the stones around him in the desert, right? Listening for their wisdom. And in his hunger, he imagines them as loaves of bread on the desert floor. Oh, couldn't I just turn those stones to bread? Wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't that say something about who I am as the son of God and I could really beat this hunger that I have? What did the stones have to teach him? Are they physical nourishment for him alone or spiritual nourishment of a different kind? So Bishop Charleston, he points out how as the oldest living things, a theological principle is embodied in the stone. A single stone, a single God. The stone would have reminded Jesus of this, of the one God that is in all things and for all things. In effect, this stone expresses this, the same monotheistic formula found in ancient Israel, the refrain that God is one. Stones point to and affirm the power of the one true God, cautioning Jesus and us not to fall into this temptation of thinking too highly of ourselves at the expense of others. Cautioning against the ways our doing feeds our hunger for more. More recognition, more rugged individualism, more success. Jesus understands what his oldest relatives, the stones, are trying to tell him. They are not there just for him and for his hunger, but for the people. So Jesus' profession of faith, as he says, the people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That would have been the way that the stones helped Jesus to not let any sense of self and the need to perform and do pull him away from his calling to be one with the people. For God is one. That's pretty powerful stuff, right? I thought that was, I just thought that was fascinating. So let's, with all this, let's weave this all together to see what we can hear in it together. So first, I have to confess to you that I am a rock person. What I mean by that is when I go places, like whether it's on a hike or the beach or to like Scotland or Mexico, like I come back with rocks in my pockets and in my suitcase and like I just have so many rocks in my life from all the places that I've been to, in my jacket pockets and my, on my shelves and in like bowls and jars and in my home, in my office. And I wonder, are you with me? Do you do this too? Are you a rock person? Shout out to all the rock hoarders out there, okay? Yes. So there's a part of me, and I think there's a part of us, that knows this wisdom that stones hold. We gravitate towards holding them and skipping them across lakes. It may be why kids can throw rocks into any body of water for a limitless amount of time, right? It's why we road trip to Yosemite and Yellowstone and Grand Canyon. There's something there. I mean, the Grand Canyon is more than just a really big hole, right? Right, there's something there. I wonder if, as we experience Jesus here, it just so it is for us. We need things like these stones. We need touchstones that remind us of who we are, that pull us into our right mind and spirit and place. And actual stones are not the only possible touchstones for us that remind us of God and this grand story that we are a part of and who we are in this story. So let me tell you just a quick story uh, to capture this about my drive to church. It's probably about two years ago on a Sunday morning. So I'm in the car. Both my kids are in the car, June and Levi. Uh, Jason was already at church. And uh, we, we, as we stopped in the turn to like turn onto the interstate, in the car in front of us was the family that lives across the street. Ooh, do you think they're going to Salt House too? My kids ask. 
and I, I know this family doesn't go to church and they aren't interested in church. They're great. I mean, they support Jason and me and the work that we do. They're great. But the likelihood that they are headed to Salt House at this moment, not great. So I said to my kids, something like, uh, you, know, you know, I don't think so. I, you know, we've talked about how people have different kinds of faith. They go to different kinds of churches. And some people don't go to any church or even really believe in God. And that's how it is in, in their family. So they're probably not headed to Salt House right now. Though that'd be really cool if it was. To which my kids said, then why do we have to go? Right? <laughs> to which I said something like, <laughs> hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> I said, you know, We like to go back every Sunday to church so that we can remember that we are loved by our God, our God who is with us always, and and so that we can be with people who hug us and know us and who remind us of who we are as God's beloved people. Because man, I forget that all the time. So we come back to be with people who who remind us and who help us to figure out how to live with Jesus' love. And my kids seem satisfied with the answer or they'd lost interest. It could have been either way. So, but it's true, right? Stones aren't the only touchstones for us, Jesus followers, since the beginning of this movement. We have been people who are touchstones for each other, right? We remind and ground each other. We hold each other's longings and questions and help find language to make sense of it all and make sense of what it means that we are beloved. We're touchstones for each other who draw each other back into the story of God. That is our story. This is what happens in a community of Jesus followers. And I know there is harm and exclusion and other things that can happen in churches, but that's not what Jesus intended. At our best, we are touchstones for each other which is funny to say at this time when we can't even be in the same room as each other, but it also makes it the best time to call this out, yes? We need each other. So my friends, what do we do with all of this? Well, this first temptation of Jesus asks us to confront the great lie that I am what I do. And we have to spend our whole lives pushing back against this lie, right? We're not going to solve it today, but this morning, I do want to offer us two ways that we can respond to this, okay? So first is this. So the only times I've really witnessed folks able to come out from this lie is when they were able to stop doing the things, like really stop, Uh, whether forced to or have chosen to completely stop, the kind of stop that comes from like retirement or quitting or getting fired from a job or empty nest or like the end of a relationship or health crises when our bodies are ill or they can't do what they used to do. So all those times when we just aren't doing, we're not doing all the things that we usually do. And it could be when we're in quarantine during an endemic, right? So it can be such hard, disorienting time, like crisis of identity time, because we're doing the difficult work of disassociating who we are from what we do. I wonder if you experienced times like that where you have had to or you have stopped something and experienced kind of that crisis of identity. It's also, man, it's just... It's just challenging for us to really stop, but it's necessary in order to combat this lie. And for those of us trying to embody the life of Jesus, one way that we do stop the things, honestly, it's the practice of Sabbath. It's built into the story of creation in Genesis 1, that even God took a day of rest out of the week, right? We've said here a lot before how Sabbath is, it means to cease striving regularly, Moments of Sabbath rest daily, but also those weekly rhythms. Sabbath is the resistance to this great lie that we are what we do. And embracing the truth that we are beloved even when we're unproductive. Man, I have a hard time with that one, right? So my friends, this lie, it asks of us to regularly cease striving. And it isn't just our job we're talking about, it's all the ways that we keep at the things. When can you have rhythms of stopping and having unproductive, unstructured time? When can you do that this week? It's interesting to consider how this is uh, harder or easier because of the isolation that's happening in light of the coronavirus, right? 
So even with this in mind, what do you want to try as a way to stop this week? And if you hear this and roll your eyes or you're someone who has trouble making time for rest and play and Sabbath unstructured time, I invite you to pay attention to that resistance, yeah? I can be one of those people too. And if this is a wilderness time for you already, if you're in a season when your body isn't the same as it used to be or you don't have work, then how can you open to receive this identity as beloved in the not doing that you're in now? Because you are not what you do or what you don't do. So that's the first thing for our response. What does Sabbath look like? So I invite you to type in again in the comments section if that, if you are coming up with something like, okay, I want to, you know, this week, this is some time I'm going to make, carve out this kind of time and space. When and how will you practice Sabbath this week? Cease striving because you are not what you do. Second, when it comes to this lie, again, just coming back to name that man, we need each other. Like Jesus with his stones, we need the touchstone of being together in community to be reminded that there is another way to exist in this world that does not demand our doing. A way to exist in this world that is holistic and inclusive of the needs and contributions of everyone, not centered on our own accomplishments and performance and checklists. Friends, our God came in flesh as human to show us how we need an embodied, physical, human, relational touchstone. And I love that we get to be that for each other. So this is why we have essentially made this one of our marks of membership here at Salt House. So what I mean by that, I wanna give this some context. Most of us have heard how this Lent, we are preparing for a special membership initiation retreat in three weeks on Sunday, March 29th. So that day we'll celebrate our fifth anniversary, our birthday as a church, uh, that morning in worship, woohoo! And then that day, Uh, we'll have an optional, unique spiritual experience of initiating our community into a newly articulated definition of membership. Even as we're almost five years old, we're only now initiating what membership means here in practice, which we need to do. We need to have this. We have to define membership to be a healthy church in our denomination. We are part of the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, and uh, And we're also, just to be a legal nonprofit in Washington State, we have to have, like, all these guidelines in place. We need to have membership defined. But we have intentionally sorted this out in a way that is fun and meaningful and true to who we are. So we see membership as the thing to opt into for those who want Salt House to become a home. The time we intentionally cross the threshold into a place where we belong and help in the running of the household. A moment of mutual commitment, our yes and promise to Salt House, and Salt House's yes and promise to us. So part of our journey through the wilderness this Lent is this invitation to consider crossing the threshold into Salt House in this official way. And for those who may be new today, I promise we do not always talk about membership, okay? But this is something, a season that we are talking about membership. And to be clear, we are radically welcoming, welcoming of all people. Everyone can participate in whatever they, way they are able to participate in this community, even online. So just to be clear. But each of Jesus' three temptations we're walking through with Lent, uh, each, each one of them marks one of our three uh, marks of membership that our team has articulated. So these, these are the marks, the expectations of what we commit to. And today's temptation, this first temptation, clearly points us toward our first mark of membership, which we've simply called show up. Show up. It is the commitment to be here show up on Sundays, as well as making an effort to join in meals and groups and events and to volunteer, finding your own rhythm of how that works for the life stage that you are in right now, to show up, to be here, and to be present, to show up with your story. So that's the commitment we ask of members, to be here. And in response, Salt House commits to receive you fully as you are. We invite you to show up with your authentic self as you feel safe to do so. So to be here, to be present, to be you. Because we need the touchstone of one another to remember who we are. And remember there's another way to be in this world and it's not dependent on what we do. Man, I need someone to see me in that way, to tell me that like every day, we all do. That's why it's a mark of commitment here in this community. So, all of this, in conclusion, to wrap it all, friends, here are, th- 
I just keep making lists, but this is the final one. So there are just three very quick things, simple ways to put this all into practice, okay? So warning, I'm about to ask you to type more things into the computer or in the phone that you have, so put down that fidget spinner or the laundry that you're folding or the thorough notes that you're taking and get ready, okay? So the first thing, this is just the final call for any prayer requests. Today, if you haven't sent them in yet, remember, link to that bulletin page, and we're asking you to just name the one thing that's on your heart this morning. How would you ask God to meet you today? Um, it'll be anonymous, and Pastor Ryan will gather those in a moment, and we will pr pray through them. Uh, so as soon as I finish this sermon, their time is up, so like a minute and a half. So take that time to do that if you haven't yet. Even if you're watching or listening later, we love to receive those prayers, that one thing, so we will pray them even if they come in later as well. So that's the first response, name your prayer. Second, that question of what might Sabbath look like, to cease striving, what does that look like for you in your week? If you haven't typed that in yet, please do put that down, one practice that you'll do. So that's the second response, your Sabbath moment for the week. Third and finally, consider the membership retreat. Consider the retreat as a way to make a commitment of having a regular rhythm of touchstone times here with people who remind you of who you are and what you are to do in the world. So you can RCP on the website, on our website. Um, there's a link that we're putting in there. Uh, we'll also, yeah, so just go ahead and access that in different ways. With this, also with this third and final response, another touchstone response uh, that doesn't involve the retreat is considering just who is someone who's a touchstone person for you? Someone who reminds you that you are not what you do. How can you reach out to them this week? Even if it has to be a phone call or a video call in the midst of this virus craziness, who and how can you make touchstone time this week? That's the third and final response. My goodness, that's a lot. You got it all? Holding all those things? Good. So friends, like Nicodemus, this week, we let Jesus confront us and confound us in all the ways that we think we have it together to see that we don't and to know that that's okay. And we don't have to be ashamed and hide under any kind of darkness. This is what the wilderness can do in us, breaking through our constructs to distill us down to know who we are if we let it. And today, the wilderness reminds us that who we are is not what we do. Amen? Amen. We're going to sing now. So friends, join in as you learn this song or use this as time just to be with God and listen to finalize those responses.